One day, this body will stop functioning. The heart will no longer beat and the brain will stop sending signals. Biologically, the system shuts down. Science is comfortable up to this point. But beyond this moment lies a cushion so disruptive that most laboratories avoid it and most textbooks remain silent. Does everything truly end here or does something continue? This video is not casual content. It is not motivational talk. It is not spiritual storytelling. This is one of the most dangerous questions modern science can ask. Because if consciousness is nothing more than brain chemistry, then death is absolute. There is no memory, no continuity, and no identity. End of the story. But if even a fraction of consciousness exists independent of the brain, then everything we believe about life, death, and identity collapses. We are examining documented cases, peer-reviewed research, medical records, and scientific anomalies that refuse to fit inside the materialist model. These are cases that were investigated, verified, and quietly archived because they raised questions science was not ready to answer. So, stay till the end because what you realize may be deeply unsettling. Section 1. The Core Scientific Problem Let's start with a foundational issue. Science has never explained consciousness. Neuroscience can map brain activity, show which areas activate during emotions and even predict behavior patterns. But it cannot answer one basic question. Why does experience exist at all? Why does electrical activity feel like fear, love, pain or awareness? This is known as the hard problem of consciousness, a term coined by philosopher David Chalmers. If consciousness were produced by the brain, damaging the brain should reduce or destroy awareness in direct proportion. But real-world data often contradicts this assumption. And this is where rebirth enters the discussion, not as a belief but as an unresolved anomaly. Section 2. Children who remember past lives. One of the most documented and scientifically investigated areas related to rebirth involves childhood past life memories. The leading researcher in this field was Dr. Stevenson, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia. He investigated over 2,500 cases across different cultures, countries, and belief systems. What made his work unique was its strict methodology. He did not accept vague stories and required verifiable details. In many cases, children between the ages of 2 and 6 spontaneously described the names of previous families, specific locations they had never visited, details of deaths they could not have learned, and personal habits of deceased individuals. Most importantly, these memories faded with age, which aligns with non-stages of brain development. Now let's discuss its third section, birthmarks and biological evidence. This is where the evidence becomes difficult to explain using only material science. Dr. Stevenson studied over 200 cases in which young children were born with birthmarks or physical defects that matched the injuries or causes of death of people they later claimed to remember. For example, some children had gunshot-like marks that matched recorded entry and exit wounds, burn marks that matched fatal fire accidents, or missing fingers that matched documented amputations. These were not loose or imagined similarities. Doctors compared the child's birthmarks with medical records autopsy reports and photographs of the deceased individuals. At this point, an important question naturally arises. 
If consciousness or reincarnation is not physical, then why would the new body show physical marks at all? Dr. Stevenson did not claim that the body itself reincarnates. The idea is simpler and more restrained. If consciousness continues and carries information, that information may influence how the new body forms during early pregnancy. Science already recognizes that non-genetic factors such as stress, hormones, and biological signaling can influence physical development. The exact mechanism is unknown, but it does not violate scientific logic. In many cases, the child's family had no connection with the deceased person's family. There was no contact, no shared location, and no cultural influence. Because of this, genetics alone cannot explain these cases. That is why Stevenson referred to his findings as evidence, not final proof. They point toward a real phenomena that science does not yet fully understand. Section 4. Cross-Cultural Consistency Friends, a common argument against rebirth claims is cultural influence. However, the critical observation is this. These cases occur globally, including in India, the United States, Lebanon, Turkey, Thailand, and Brazil. Even in cultures where rebirth is not taught or emphasized, children report similar patterns. They appear in the same age range, show the same emotional intensity, arise through spontaneous recall, and fade over time in similar ways. If this were imagination or conditioning, we would expect major cultural differences. We do not observe that. Instead, we see statistical consistency, which is one of the strongest indicators of a genuine phenomenon. Now, we will discuss its fifth section, near-death experiences and consciousness without brain activity. Let's now move to a related domain, near-death experiences, commonly known as NDEs. During cardiac arrest, brain activity drops dramatically within seconds. Yet, many patients report clear thinking, accurate perception of their surroundings, out-of-body experiences, and detailed recall of medical procedures. In some cases, patients described events that occurred while they were clinically unconscious. These reports were later confirmed by doctors and nurses. From a strict neurological perspective, this should be impossible. No measurable brain activity should mean no conscious experience, and yet awareness persists. This raises a disturbing question. Is the brain generating consciousness or is it merely receiving it? Section 6. The brain as a filter, not a generator. Some scientists are now exploring an alternative model known as the filter theory of consciousness. According to this model, consciousness exists independently while the brain limits, localizes, and filters it. Death removes the filter, not the consciousness itself. This theory aligns with observations from psychedelic research, deep meditative states, paradoxical brain injuries, and near-death experience data. In certain brain injuries, people reported expanded awareness rather than reduced awareness. This directly contradicts the idea that the brain produces consciousness. If consciousness can survive brain shutdown, then rebirth becomes a logical possibility rather than a mystical one. Now come to section 7, memory storage beyond the brain. This brings us to another critical question. Where is memory actually stored? Neuroscience generally assumes that the memory is stored in neural networks. However, experiments show that removing brain tissue does not necessarily erase specific memories. People with severe brain degeneration often retain their sense of identity and that some memories return 
after being clinically inaccessible. Memory appears to be more distributed and non-local than previously expected. In rebirth cases, children access memories they could not have physically acquired. This suggests that memory may not be entirely biological in nature. Now comes section 8, quantum physics and consciousness. Quantum physics does not directly explain rebirth, but it challenges classical assumptions. At the quantum level, particles exist as possibilities. Observers influence outcomes and information is never destroyed. The principle of information conservation states that information cannot be erased, only transformed. If consciousness is a form of information, then death cannot destroy it. It can only reorganize it. This does not prove rebirth, but it removes the assumption that rebirth is impossible. Section 9. Why science resists this topic? Why does rebirth remain controversial? Because it challenges foundational assumptions. Materialism assumes that the mind equals the brain, that death equals annihilation, and that consciousness is local and confined. Rebirth suggests something very different, namely that consciousness may be primary, that the brain may be a temporary interface, and that identity may be transferable in some form. This forces science to expand its framework. And historically, science resists paradigm shifts until the evidence becomes overwhelming. And here comes the last section, section 10. What rebirth really implies? Rebirth does not imply souls randomly jumping from one body into another. Scientific interpretations suggest something more subtle. They point toward continuity of patterns, persistence of information and psychological imprints carrying forward. Just as energy follows laws, consciousness may also follow informational laws. This aligns with observations related to unfinished emotional patterns, trauma continuity and recurring personality tendencies. Rebirth may not involve the repetition of identity but rather the continuation of unfinished processes. My dear friends, rebirth is not proven in the same way gravity is proven, but neither is consciousness, and yet science studies consciousness seriously. The evidence examined today includes consistent childhood memories, verifiable biological correlations, conscious awareness without measurable brain function and non-local properties of information. Together, these form a coherent pattern, a pattern that science can no longer ignore. The real question is no longer whether rebirth is real. The real question is what consciousness truly is and how far it extends. And once science answers that, rebirth may no longer sound extraordinary. It may sound inevitable. Thank you for watching.